So what makes an investment great property? What makes it different from all the other properties? What's the right strategy for this stage of the property cycle? And what's the end game that property investors should be considering at the moment, considering how coronavirus has hampered our property cycle. That's what we're going to chat about in today's episode of the Michael Yardney podcast. And even if you've listened to some of my podcasts and heard some of my thoughts and theories about what to do, even if you've read some of my blogs, and if you go back to episode one of the Michael Yardney podcast, I discussed what an investment grade property is. Today, there's going to be some tweaks, some changes because of where we are in the property cycle, because of what's going on, and I'm going to share with you my new end game because my living off equity strategy that has stood the test of time for many years is not going to work for most investors in the current market, partly related to finance, and I'll explain that as we get on with the show. So lots to discuss today, getting back to some basics, but some very important messages so that at the end of today's show, you're going to become a more informed investor, you're going to have a system, a strategy to work towards to help build your own financial independence. So welcome once again to the Michael Yardney Podcast. Welcome to the Michael Yardney Podcast, where twice each week you will learn a number of new ideas regarding success, property investment, and money in around 30 minutes. Our show is brought to you by Metropole, who specialize in helping you grow, protect, and pass on your wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. Now, here's your host, Michael Yardney, Australia's most trusted property commentator who has once again been voted Australia's leading property investment advisor. That's the fifth time he's won a similar award in the last seven years. The motivation for this particular episode of the Michael Yardney podcast came from two things that happened to me over the last couple of days. One was a journalist, Emma, who asked me a list of questions for an article she was writing about what makes an investment-grade property and why most properties aren't what I call investment-grade. And even though they're very basic concepts, I realised that a lot of people need to understand these because they haven't got them right. And so please excuse me if you've heard some of this before, but I think it's important revision before we get onto some of the deeper topics. And if you haven't heard this before, boy, is this going to be a revelation. The other thing that happened this week was a question that was left on Property Update under an article. I leave get questions all the time and I love answering them and helping my readers. And the question went along the lines of this gentleman had unfortunately been trying to sell his property for 80 days. It was in Logan in Queensland in a poor socioeconomic area and I guess he got advice from one of those so-called gurus who's been recommending that area for a long time, and it just hasn't done anything. And this was his concern. He'd owned the property for 10 years, and it hadn't done anything, and boy, has he missed out. And now that he's trying to sell it because it's in a secondary location, he can't move it on either. So let's first have a talk about what makes a good investment, then what makes a good property investment. And then we're going to talk a bit about the strategy because the strategy really has to come first. In other words, what are you trying to achieve? You've got to understand your end game. So I'm going to discuss that a bit too because in the past, for many, many years, my end game was living off the equity of my property portfolio by continuously borrowing and by having a pretty low loan to value ratio. But that has just become too hard for most investors. It still is... A, possible for people with a very substantial asset base, but the rules of finance have changed so much in the last decade or so after the global financial crisis. So I'm going to share with you something that I don't think I've shared in my podcast before, or not clearly anyway. So I'm going to explain to you the end game that we recommend to most of our clients, and it's probably going to be the sort of thing you should be aiming at as well. So lots to discuss. And let's first start with what makes a good investment grade property because there are about 10.4 million dwellings in Australia and at any one time there are hundreds of thousands of properties for sale. Now currently the coronavirus cocoon that we're all living in has caused a lull in the market and it's encouraged people to consider hey 
maybe it's a good time during this lull to get into property. We're getting a lot of inquiries to our team at Metropole about long-term long-term focused investors considering buying their first or their next investment property. And the first thing we say is don't just rush out and buy any property because not all properties make good investments. In fact, in my mind, less than 4% of properties on the market currently are what I call investment grade. You see, over the last few months, as our property markets have slowed down, while there are still many properties on offer, there's a real shortage of quality. Again, what I call investment grade properties. I'll explain that in a moment. Of course, any property can become an investment. All you do is you move the owner out, put a tenant in, and it's an investment. But that doesn't make it investment grade. So to help you understand what I consider investment grade, let's first look at the characteristics of any great investment. And then let's see what types of property fit into these criteria. Now, I don't only invest in property. I do have residential property, industrial, commercial, uh, retail, and I also have shares and managed funds, and I also own businesses. So I invest in a number of different asset classes. So what makes a good investment? I think a good investment has a number of characteristics. First of all, strong, stable rates of capital appreciation. A good investment, in my mind, also gives you steady cash flow. A good investment, one of the characteristics I look for is liquidity, the ability to get my money out by either selling or borrowing against my investments. A good investment usually has an element of easy management. It shouldn't be too hard work. It should be a good hedge against inflation and it should also offer tax benefits. Now, it doesn't have to offer all of those and it definitely they aren't all in equal proportions. To me, capital growth is really very important or it was more so in the early stage of my investment career as I was building my asset base. Nowhere near as important to me today now that I've got a substantial asset base. So again, it's important to understand as a property investor how you make your money out of property and it's really in four ways. See, most people think, I'll make my money out of rental return. No, there's more than that. Capital growth is a way that you make money. Now, maybe it's not money that you can bank, or not straight away. You eventually can borrow against that. But capital growth is as your property appreciates in value over time. Second way you make money out of residential real estate is rental returns, the cash flow you get from your tenant. The third way, one I love, is accelerated or forced growth. That's where you manufacture capital growth by adding value to your property through renovations or development. And then the last way is tax benefits, things like negative gearing and depreciation allowances. But again, not all returns are created equal. Capital growth isn't taxed while rental returns are. And then as your property increases in value, as you get capital growth, the rent increases in turn, and that also generates more cash flow. Now, clearly you need cash flow to hold on to your property portfolio for long enough so that the power of compounding kicks in. That means you need a finance strategy. It means you have to have a financial buffer to see you through lean times. So you need to be careful about your cash flow. You need the ability to service your debts. Too many investors don't recognise, though, that property investments came of finance with some houses thrown in the middle. And they leave themselves open to the financial woes by not having rainy day money that they can draw down when needed, which often results in them selling at the wrong time of the cycle. Now, interestingly, I'm not seeing a lot of it now. I did see a lot of that a couple of years ago where people just didn't get themselves set up right. And when the tenant wasn't paying the rent or they lost their job or things like that, they they were financially compromised. So bottom line is cash flow keeps you in the game, but it's really capital growth that gets you out of the rat race. And in my mind, capital growth is the most important factor of all, even though not everyone agrees with me. But let's face it. If you listen to who everyone else listens to, you're going to get the same results as most investors. And that's not good. Statistics show that most property investors fail. They never achieve the financial freedom they aspire to. And this is in part due to the fact that they follow the wrong strategy. Many of them chase cash flow. Now, there's other reasons why they don't achieve their financial success as well. But don't misunderstand me. Cash flow is the ultimate aim. It's the ultimate goal. But only once you've built a sufficiently large asset base of investment grade properties. And that means your investment journey is going to comprise five stages. Number one, the education stage, learning what property investment is all about. Number two, the saving stage. You've got to spend less than you earn and trap this excess cash flow in a savings account and build up a deposit so that you can invest. 
Number three is the asset accumulation stage. And it's going to take two or three property cycles to build a sufficiently large asset base of income producing properties to move to the next stage. The trouble is most people think property is a get-rich-quick scheme. They try and do it too quickly. It doesn't work. Don't believe it. You can't buy five properties in five years or ten properties in ten minutes, no matter what those emails you get in your inbox say. So stage one, education. Stage two, saving. Stage three, accumulation. Stage four, then you lower your loan-to-value ratio. That's The asset accumulation stage requires borrowing, it requires gearing, but eventually you must lower your loan to asset ratios so you can then, then eventually leave off the cash flow of your property portfolio. So the safest way through this journey, which will obviously take a number of property cycles, is to ensure that you only buy the sort of properties that are going to outperform the market averages with regard to capital growth. You need that big asset base first. If you do it in the wrong order, it just doesn't work. And that's why most property investors never get the financial freedom they desire. You've heard the statistics before. There's 2.1 or so million property investors in Australia. 1.9 million own one or two properties. 21,000 something, 21,400 or something own six or more properties. Where do you want to be? 1.9 million those investors who own one or two properties? What do you want to be in that small group? 21,000, that's it, who own six or more properties. So to get the right property, to choose an investment grade property, I use a six-stranded strategic approach. I'd only buy properties that have owner-occupier appeal. Now, I'm not planning to sell my property, but because owner-occupiers will buy similar properties around mine, they'll push up real estate values, local real estate values, and this will be particularly important in the future as the percentage of investors in the market is likely to diminish for a while. I only buy my properties below intrinsic value. So the first strand is to buy properties with owner occupy appeal. The second strand is to buy below intrinsic value. That's why I avoid new properties or off the plan properties, which come at a premium, too many things in the pie. The third strand of my six stranded approach is to buy a property with high land to asset ratio. In other words, it's the land that appreciates. But that doesn't necessarily mean I need a large block of land. I mean, you can buy acres out in regional Australia in the middle of Australia that won't go up in value. I'd rather own a tenth of a block of uh, apartments in, in one of the better suburbs of Melbourne, Sydney or Brisbane rather than acres in the outer suburbs. But the land is the bit that's got to be valuable. And so the land component should make up a significant part of your asset value. But when you buy in the middle of the CBD, yeah, the land's more valuable in the middle of our CBDs than it is in the suburbs. But you're putting two, three hundred apartments there. So your land to asset ratio, the portion of land applicable to your property is going to be too low. So as I keep working through my six stranded approach, the next one is buying in an area with a long history of strong above average capital growth and an area that's going to continue to outperform the averages because of the demographics in the area. And that's often related to gentrification. The fifth strand is I like to find a property with a twist, something unique about it, something special, something different or scarce about the property. Now, sometimes it's an apartment with bigger balconies, two balconies. It may have city views. It may have a double garage. It may have two carports, something special and unique so that when other properties come up for lease or for sale around it, this is the one people are going to want. And the last of my six strands is I like the sort of property where I can manufacture capital growth through refurbishments or renovations or redevelopment, rather than waiting for the market to do the heavy lifting, especially as we're heading into a period of lower capital growth, I want to manufacture my own capital growth. So as I said, not all properties are investment grade. As I said, only about 4% of those on the market are currently investment grade. Now, there's a lot of investment stock out there, but don't confuse the two. Investment stock are properties specifically built for the investor market. You know, think about all those new high-rise apartments that are littering our cities, yet they're not investment grade. They're what the property marketers and developers sell in bulk to naive investors, usually off the plan, but they're not investment grade because they have little owner-occupier appeal, they lack scarcity, they're usually bought at a premium, and there's no ability to add value. In fact, off-the-plan apartments make terrible investments and always have. Now, I know there's a small group of people who are thinking, hey, I'll buy off the plan now, and what I'm going to do is settle in two years. This coronavirus trouble's all going to be over by then. It's all going to be okay. Wrong. Steer clear of those. 
A year or so ago, analysis by BIS Oxford Economics reported that apartments sold off the plan over the previous eight years did very, very poorly. Two out of three Melbourne apartments made no price gains or lost money upon resale over an eight-year period. And this is despite a period, this was before the coronavirus, this happened a year or two ago when the BIS Oxford report came out, and that was despite a record immigration, a significant Melbourne property boom. In Brisbane, about half the apartments bought off the plan were selling at a loss or no profit over the last eight-year period. And in Sydney, uh, one in four apartments bought uh, between 2015 and 2018 when this report came out was selling at a loss. In other words, more investors in off-the-plan high-rise apartments lost money than made money. And of course, there's all of those that hadn't sold, that are sitting on their losses, their their accumulated losses, properties that are continually falling in value. They just haven't crystallised their losses yet. According to BIS research, again, resales of apartments within a three to five kilometre of the central Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane CBDs realised consistent lower prices than established apartment resales. In other words, new apartments just did not perform as well as established apartments. So on the other hand, rather than looking for those new and off-the-plan apartments, investment-grade properties, and I've got no problem with buying apartments, they're going to appeal to a wider affluent owner-occupier range of people. But the owner-occupiers don't want to live in those big high-rise towers. They're going to be in the right location. Now, by this, I don't mean just the right suburb, one with multiple growth drivers, but they're also going to be within a short walking distance to lifestyle amenities such as cafes and shops and restaurants and parks. The right apartments are going to be close to public transports, a factor that's going to become more and more important in the future as the population of our cities grow, as our roads become more congested, people aren't going to want to commute as long. So in the short term, you know, people aren't wanting to go on public transport at all, but when life gets on again, When life becomes more normal, whatever the normal is going to be, people aren't going to want to commute long distances. So again, an investment-grade property has other great characteristics. It's got street appeal, a nice aspect. It offers security. It has off-street parking, potential to add value through renovations, and as I said before, a high land-to-asset ratio, which you won't get in those large towers. So the bottom line is buying the right investment-grade property is all about following a proven blueprint that successful investors follow. This increases your chance of better financial return and reduces your risk of getting caught out as property markets move into this next couple of years where you can't just count on buying any property and it's going to go up in value. By the way, you never could, but definitely not moving forward now. But it's not just about property. So I talked about property, but this other very big factor. And if you've been following me in my blogs and my podcasts by now, you'd know that location is going to do about 80% of the heavy lifting of your property's capital growth. And not all locations are created equal. Some suburbs are going to be more popular than others. Some areas are going to have more scarcity than others. And over time, some land is going to increase in value more than others. And that's why it's important to buy your investment property in a suburb which is dominated by by more homeowners than investors, rather than suburbs that are those where tenants predominate. And you'll find suburbs with more affluent owners, they're going to outperform the cheaper outer suburbs where wages growth is likely to be more stagnant moving forward. But it's the same all over the world. There's nothing new about this. Go to any major city, London, Paris, Vienna, Los Angeles, and you'll find that the wealthy people tend to live within 5, 10, 15 minutes of of the CBD or near the water. Why is this so? Well, the cynics would say they can afford to. (laughs) And in fact, that's partly true. In general, the more established suburbs with better infrastructure, shopping and amenities, tend to be close to the CBD and close to the water. And that's where the wealthy want to. That's where the wealthy can afford to live. And they're prepared to pay a premium to live there. The rich don't like to commute. So by focusing your research on what's often overlooked, owner-occupiers, what the owner-occupiers are doing, you may find the investments that are going to outperform the market and deliver strong value and long-term capital growth. Interestingly, that's not on the list of most investors' criteria, is it? What are the owner-occupiers doing? Remember, two-thirds of our markets are owner-occupiers. 
and it's one of the most significant influences on property. But as I said, it's commonly overlooked. With almost 70% of all the homes in Australia being owner-occupied, this underpins the steady long-term growth of property values. On the other hand, we love to think as investors, and investors, they compromise about 30% of the market. At the moment, it's a bit less than that because there are not as many investors in the market. During boom times, it gets to a higher percentage. But it's the investors who create our property booms, often driven by the fear of missing out or greed, and they similarly make our property downturns worse when they exit the market or they sit on the sidelines. And so it's the investors that create the volatility in the market, while it's the owner-occupiers who underpin property value. So I like investing in areas where there's a high percentage of owner-occupiers, you'll find the values in those suburbs much, much more stable. Now, here's a relatively current snapshot of the national property market according to the Australian Bureau of Statistics and CoreLogic. There are about 10.4 million residential dwellings in Australia, and they've got a total value of $7.2 trillion. All these properties are spread around 15,000 suburbs, and up till now, we've been building 130 to 160 new dwellings every year. Now, with the coronavirus shutdown, with the lack of immigration, uh, that's slowing down a bit. But when you take the total debt of all these dwellings, all borrowings for residential real estate, it adds up to $1.83 trillion. Remember, $7.2 trillion is the value of these properties, and that gives us an overall loan-to-value ratio of residential real estate, about 27% or so. Residential real estate isn't overgeared. Interestingly, though, it makes up 52.4% of Australia's household wealth. Investors own around about 27% of the dwellings by numbers and 24% by value. And there are 2 million property investors in Australia, and on average, they own 1.28 properties. In other words, most never get the wealth they desire, like I said a few minutes ago. So from these figures, it's clear that owner-occupiers comprise the largest proportion of the market. In fact, they are number of investors 2 to 1 which is why I always give the following advice for investors searching for a strong property performer. Buy the type of property that will appeal to owner-occupiers. And as I've explained, in my mind, investment-grade properties have to have that as one of the main criteria. So we spent a lot of time talking about properties, and thank you for bearing with me. But now I want to talk about your investment strategy, because this really has to come first. So while most investors start with property and they think, oh, oh, I'm going to buy something uh, near where I live or near where I want to retire or near where I want to holiday, it's actually the wrong way around. It's important to start with the end game in mind and understand what you're going to need to do to achieve your end game. And then you've got to build a plan. You've got to build a strategy to get there. The problem is most People become property investors without putting much thought into it. Some upgrade their home and turn their old house into an investment. However, that doesn't mean it's going to be a good investment just because they bought it for emotional reasons a number of years ago rather than for the objective reasons, the reasons I've just outlined what makes a good investment property. And as I said, others buy off the plan because they get promised from marketers uh, that they're going to get uh, good tax benefits or negative gearing or they're going to get uh, uh, rental guarantees. A lot of others buy property in their comfort zone, close to where they live. Now, don't make the mistake many investors make and buy in your own backyard, just because you're familiar with it. Searching for a property is not the same as researching for a property. Just because you know it is not a good reason to buy there. In fact, I was fascinated by a recent university study that showed that investors who bought a property close to where they lived tended to buy underperforming properties. And they didn't even get a price advantage for buying the property where they knew. You've heard it before. Failing to plan is really planning to fail. On the other hand, strategic investors, they devise a strategy. They bring their future into the present and devise a plan to achieve the results. So what will your end game look like? What should it be? Now, remember... In the past, if you read my books, I like the concept of building a big asset base and continuously borrowing against it, lowering your loan-to-value ratio so you still had serviceability, but living off the equity of your property portfolio. 
But in the last few years, it's become harder and harder. In fact, it particularly became hard since the global financial crisis. But I know a number of our clients and a few of my friends who are still able to do that. It's getting harder with finance, though. It's hard to get finance for your first property. It's hard to get that deposit gap to get going. Once you're in the game, it's hard to get the serviceability for your second and third properties, isn't it? And then once you've got a substantial property portfolio, the banks are making it harder with their stricter serviceability criteria and their requirement for you to repay debt today to just keep borrowing equity. So the end game is you're going to need a big asset base. Now, I don't know you. I don't know how long it's going to be before you retire. I don't know how much income you're going to earn. I don't know when you retire whether you will be able to negatively gear property still or not, whether there will be a capital gains tax or not, whether the government's going to change the GST or superannuation rules or not. I don't know how much superannuation you're going to have. What I do know is that if you have a substantial asset base, you're going to have choices. And if you don't, you're not going to have the choices you're going to need to be able to enjoy the life that you want to enjoy. So your job between now and then is to build a substantial asset base. And at the end, your end game will probably look something like this. By the way, this is the sort of thing that we do when we sit down with our clients at Metropole and build them a customised strategic property plan. We actually work out exactly what the numbers are. Of course, I can't tell you that for you. I don't know enough about you. I don't know anything about you, really, other than thank you for listening to my podcast. But the end game is you're going to have your own home with no debt against it. I don't want you to go into your retirement years having debt against your home. I'd also like to see you have a substantial asset base of investment-grade residential real estate. But I don't want you to have no debt against that because I still want you to benefit from gearing. And so, therefore, I'd like you to have a property portfolio with assets in a number of different states, different classes of assets in your property portfolio to a bit of diversification. We'll discuss that in a different podcast. Uh, And as I said, it should still have some gearing, but should not be at that stage a low enough loan to value ratio so that you're getting some positive cash flow from it. I'd also like you to have some commercial properties which are going to bring cash flow in. So if you're getting the cash flow from there and also maybe from shares or managed funds, you're not going to necessarily need such a low loan to value ratio in your residential real estate. So you can have your own home with no debt, residential real estate, some cash flow real estate. And that doesn't mean residential properties in poor areas, but commercial real estate is a good cash cow. And yes, you're going to need some shares or managed funds and they may be in your super or not. But by having a mixture of growth and income assets and a conservative level of debt, you're going to be able to live off the cash machine of your investments. So how big an asset base are you going to need? How long it's going to take to accumulate? How much cash it will spin out will depend upon a myriad of factors. And that's why we always recommend at the starting point, before you even look at property, is to build a customised strategic property plan. And that's why we always recommend that for our clients at Metropole, whether they're beginning investors or people who are coming to join us along the middle of their wealth journey. We start with a plan. And that's because attaining wealth doesn't just happen. It really is the result of a well-executed plan. As I said before, planning is bringing your future into the present so you can do something about it. So when you have a strategic property plan, you're more likely to achieve the financial freedom you desire because it's going to help you define your goals. You've got to see whether your goals are realistic, especially for your timeline. It's going to help you measure your progress towards your goals, whether your property portfolio is working for you or not. And boy, do we see a lot of people who own property and it's just not getting them to where they want to be. We also, as having by having a plan, find ways to help you maximise your wealth creation through property and we identify risks you hadn't thought of. Now, I'm going to talk a bit about it later on, but if you're interested, why don't you have a look at our website, metropole.com.au and get our team to build you a, your own customised strategic property plan because the real benefit is you're going to be able to grow your wealth through your property portfolio faster and more safely than the average investor. Now, there's one thing that's maybe even worse than not having a strategy and that's having the wrong one. As I said before, residential real estate is long-term, high-growth, relatively low-yield investment. 
So your strategy, as I've said, should be to get capital growth out of your property portfolio, to grow a large asset base that eventually will give you choices. Yet many beginning investors chase cash flow or they chase the next hotspot or they try and make a quick profit by flipping. They're all recipes for disaster. Others, of course, chase tax benefits because they think negatively geared new properties are going to keep their tax down wrong. So they these people buy new properties now in the suburbs and put a deposit on off the plan property. I've already explained that. No, that's not the right way to go. They won't give you the capital growth you require to grow your wealth. Now, almost as bad as having the wrong strategy is changing your strategy. Well, not if it's the right one. I mean, you shouldn't you should change it if it's the wrong one. Unfortunately, some investors get spooked when the markets soften, like they are at the moment, and rather than sticking to a proven strategy to secure their wealth through capital growth, they opt for something else. They look for something cheap and nasty. Rather than looking for what's always worked in the long term, they look for what's going to work right now. The fundamentals haven't changed and you shouldn't change your strategy. But it's no surprise that with these investors who change their strategy, they end up with frowns when they've got inferior properties that underperform. So the underlying fundamentals of the right assets, the right finance strategy, a good plan, a good team around you, and time makes a big, big difference. That's the difference between the average investor who doesn't have those working for them and the successful investors who do. So what do you do now? Where should you turn? Well, how do you know what the next step is? I don't know. I mean, I'm giving you a lot of general advice, so please don't act on anything I've said without getting good advice. But there are four ways we can help you at Metropole if you're interested. Sure, our property markets are going to look much better as the year goes on, but you can't count on just the markets moving and doing the heavy lifting for you anymore. Correct property selection is even more important now than ever. And only selected markets are likely to outperform moving forwards. So why not get my team at Metropole, the independent team of property strategists and buyers agents to help you? Now, you need more than a buyer's agent in this market. You actually need a holistic approach. You need more than a property strategist. You need wealth, finance, tax, legal, financial planning. And we offer those services at Metropole. Our back clients grow, protect and pass on their wealth through a range of services. Yeah, we'd love to build you a strategic property plan. Yes, our buyer's agents, Australia's most trusted and awarded buyer's agency. We've been involved in $3.5 billion worth of transactions for our clients. We've got our own on-the-ground teams. They don't fly in and out from state to state. We've got wealth advisory, property management, property renovations, property development. Why not go to metropole.com.au and find out a bit about what we can do leave us your details, we'll be in contact with you and have a chat with my team. The first chat is obligation free. There are some opportunities ahead, but lots of challenges as well. Let's just go through this in more detail one-on-one with you and help you find an investment grade property. Now here's Michael's mindset message. Remember, a change in your thinking will lead to a change in your life. In my mindset message today, I'd like you to imagine today was the first day of your life. Imagine you woke up this morning and realised today's your first day on earth. You were born today under the exact circumstances in your current body in the same location with all your knowledge and all your possessions that you currently have. What would you do? Would you be disappointed looking at your body and think, that part of it was flawed? Or would you be astonished at how all your organs and systems are working in harmony? Would you complain about the weather? Or would you marvel at how the sun gives life to everything on earth? Would you focus on everything you don't have? Would you feel grateful for whatever force brought you here? Most people wake up every day living in the past. They count their mistakes, they beat themselves up about their history, and they define their self-worth by their failures. But how could you be doing that? Because today you were just born. The person born today has got no past, only a future and the present moment. If I was broke, I'd find a way of adding so much value to people who would think whatever they paid for my services was worth the investment. If I wasn't feeling energised, I'd start exercising today and give my body proper nutrition. Yesterday's tragedy is not an excuse for not doing your best today. You can't undo your past mistakes. You can only forgive yourself and make a bold new start. Forget about trying to fix something that seems broken. Focus on starting over 
and creating something even better. It all starts and ends with you. Showing up with the right intention is the most powerful commitment you can make to yourself. Today, like every day, can be the first day of your life. What would you do differently? We covered a lot of ground today, and I hope now you've got a better understanding of the types of things you should be looking for, what you should be planning for, what you should be strategizing for to build wealth through property. If you got some benefit from this, please do me a favor and pass the message on to somebody else. If somebody's passed this on to you and you're not subscribing, by the way, boy, should you be subscribing. And if you've only recently started listening to my podcast, go to your podcast app and Go to some of the downloads, click through all the downloads, listen at one and a half times speed. I still make sense that way. And there's lots of other guest experts there as well who I'm sure are going to give you great information as well. Now, in between these shows, you can catch me on social media. Just look for Michael Yardney or my daily property update blog. But if you've got some benefit from this, as I started to say, tell somebody about the show. Use the share button on the, any podcast app or just tell them about it. And let's together help make more people financially fluent, financially independent, because that's what's going to make Australia great. I look forward to catching up with you again real soon. In the meantime, have a great week. Make it a great week. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Michael Yardney podcast, which was brought to you by Metropole, who help their clients grow, protect and pass on their wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. If you like what you heard and don't already subscribe, you'll find us on iTunes or on your favorite Android app as the Michael Yardney Podcast. Watch out for our next show, which comes to you twice a week, and you'll learn some new ideas about property investment, success, and money in around 30 minutes. To get more of Michael's thoughts, go across to www.propertyupdate.com.au and sign up for his daily morning briefing and you'll hear from not only Michael, but a group of leading property success and money experts. And just a reminder that the information you heard in this show today is general educational advice and not specific investment advice, as we don't know your personal circumstances. If you're looking for specific advice, why not ask the team at Metropole to help you? 